viewers of Radio Universe Online Television, we are indeed privileged to have in, a, in our midst a very important personality. He is called a name that is known to all of us, and it is a Ghanaian name of Akan Hodge. Now allow me to introduce him to all of you. He's such a handsome gentleman <laughs> and photogenic. He is Dr. Emmanuel Kirchner. And interestingly, he happens to be the Ellen Garner Professor of History and of African and African American Studies. Open Emma Faculty Director, Harvard University Center for African Studies. Uh, Prof, we are indeed very happy that you accepted to talk to us on this very important show. You have delivered a very important lecture starting yesterday. This happens to be part of the 70th anniversary of the University of Ghana. Accompanying it is a special congregation. You presented or you are presenting two important topics. You gave one yesterday entitled Nkrumah, Coco and United States, the vision of an industrial nation state. Today you are presenting the second and final lecture entitled African, African Socialism or the Search for an Indigenous Model of Economic Development in Ghana. Uh, the two topics have some very important linkages mm. if you follow the history of the uh, Nkrumah period, especially his attempt to industrialize Ghana as the first sub-Saharan African state to get independent. Now, to the topic specifically, the vision of an industrial nation state, and the focus here is Nkrumah. But Nkrumah leave among some contemporaries in the African continent. Can we find out how Nkrumah set off at the very beginning, mm -hmm. that is post-independent? Mm -hmm. The, as you point out, this Ghana was the first country, Sub-Saharan Africa, or black African country to become independent. So there was a sense in which he was a, a trailblazer. Okay. I think one of the first acts he did that got international recognition had to do with Guinea, okay. Guinea Conakry. Uh, in 1958, the French had this famous referendum in which de Gaulle was introducing something called the French community. In Fran Francophone African countries were to vote yes or no, yes if you wanted to be part of the French community know if you don't and you want immediate independence. Okay. Of all the Francophone countries, Guinea was the only country that voted no and with that became immediately independent. The French response was to strip Guinea of everything that was theirs. They even cut telephone wires as they were leaving. Anything that was not bolted down they took. So imagine a country that has just become independent with nothing, without even the records to form the basis of planning. Uh, and the one who came to Guinea's rescue uh, was Kwame Nkrumah. And Kwame Nkrumah gave Guinea a very soft loan of 10 million pounds. That would help them through the early beginnings. It was unusual uh, for an African country to go to the aid of another African country, both 
relatively young uh, and it was uh, an act that registered across the world. The outcome was the Ghana Guinea Union, uh, a union that was not very well defined, uh, but at the same time, what it did was to get Nkrumah goodwill. Okay. So in the lifetime of their presidencies, the Ghana Guinea Union may not have been extraordinarily active. But when Nkrumah was overthrown in 66, through his death in 72, he lived in Guinea. Right. That is interesting. And this reminds us of Nkrumah's speech at independence. The independence of Ghana is meaningless. Unless it is Unless linked. It's linked to the, to the total, total liberation, liberation of Africa. Right. Maybe we were not thinking as Nkrumah did. And, and, and he meant these things. Uh, and there's a sense in which Nkrumah was born in Ghana. But he always saw himself as for Africa. And yesterday I mentioned that when I was going through his school records, everybody says I'm from Mississippi, I'm from... Nkrumah never even said he was from the Gold Coast. Nkrumah was always from Africa. Interesting, that is what, after Mbeki took power in South Africa, as if they've dusted the books of Kwame Nkrumah. And so every company today, as we speak in South Africa, adds Africa and not just South Africa. And I, I wish we are able to follow with that. But let's move ahead. Now, his Pan-Africanism has come to the fore. Ghana was then fragile. Nkrumah thought that political seek ye first the political kingdom and all other things will be added. So he sought for the political kingdom. Now coming back to industrialization and then what he did. Did he have it easy even with his cabinet and people's or stalwarts such as Arthur Lewis, who was the economic advisor. Okay, so the Arthur Lewis is an economist. Economists always assume that people are rational economic beings. Okay. And, and we will pursue actions or decisions that make the most economic sense. Nkrumah patiently explained to Arthur Lewis that he's a politician. And as a politician, he must take risks. So Arthur Lewis is trying to grow an economy. He's an economist. He looks through the lens of whether something is economically productive or it is not. You know, these days, even when we are doing presidential candidates, you have to look at the regions. If you choose one from the north, you balance it with a VP from somewhere. We see it not just here, we see it in Nigeria, we see it in other countries. Politics is the art of the pragmatic. And Nkrumah pointed out that political expediency is something that is relevant and he cannot ignore. So we were blessed as a country that on independence we had a rather substantial reserve from cocoa. For Lewis, that was to be used wisely, making investments in things that brought productive return. And Kumar knows that, okay, I have this one year, you have to put something in the district, I have that. So, so, so those were the points of contention, things that Lewis called white elephants. They were not productive. Uh, another important, uh, Lewis also believed in the Water River, especially when it was connected to bauxite. When the bauxite part was removed, when the price tag kept changing, 
he as an economist will say that okay this does not make economic sense anymore right. uh, Nkrumah saw it differently uh, and so at some point in time he feels that I give advice you don't take it I give advice you don't take it after a while I become redundant right. around this place so he decided that it would be in his own interest to resign quietly and to go before there is some sort of open confrontation or disagreement that discredits him. So we, he arranged uh, through international development organizations, he was given an offer that was a, a way out and then he stepped out. So, so that's what happened. Right, and that was the birth of development economics. The birth of development economics even preceded this. Uh, what happened is that in the 40s, Arthur Lewis worked in the colonial office in Britain. After World War II, France was devastated. Uh, Germany occupied France. Uh, uh, Britain had won the war, but almost like on its last legs. So you look across Europe, there was vast distraction. And somehow, Europe needed to be rebuilt. In terms of Europe itself in its physical state, it wasn't really producing anything to sell on the global market. So what Europe could control was the products exported from the African and Asian colonies. That is why at this point in time, Europe began to explore. Okay, maybe we need to develop them along new lines because the faster they grow, the more they can help us. It is at this point in time, prior to this, the colonial economy was essentially uh, commerce, agriculture, and mining. That was it. Now they wanted to go beyond that, thinking of everything from hydroelectricity, etc., etc., etc. It is at this point in time that people like Arthur Lewis, working in the colonial office, were taxed with thinking through what it takes to grow tropical economies. And it is out of that something called colonial economics emerged. And that is why it became development economics. Right. Let me move on. I do not want to venture into your next uh, presentation. But as somebody who has a very strong background in broadcasting, okay. I just want to tie this uh, discussion. Um, if you look at the economics of media, for instance, and for that matter, broad, broadcasting, and then you look at how, the, uh, what do you call it, uh, political economists also look at the same issue, whereas the economists who strictly and rigidly uh, follow the principles, the political economists will be looking at the historical, the social, the cultural implications of all this, which plays into regulation. Now, would you help us unpack this quagmire? Because this problem we're talking about is still with us as we speak, mm -hmm. and it is still dogging the development of African countries. Mm -hmm. I said I don't want to delve into your next thing. <laughs> what is the way forward? <laughs> the, the, there is a sense in which we need to make... Why am I giving a paper on African socialism? Right. Especially when socialism has become passé. Right. It's passed on. There is a sense in which, as a historian, in the 1960s and the 1970s, great parts or regions of the world were socialist. Eastern Europe, Africa, Asia, Latin America. So as a historian, you cannot be a good historian by ignoring them. Two is the capacity for these early African leaders to think boldly about things that today we will say were they crazy to think they could pull that off. Okay. Nyerere decides to do Ujamaa. Mm -hmm. 
over four to five years, he relocates nine million peasants and puts them in different villages. Who will try to do that today? You look at Ghana between 1959 and 1965, when Nkrumah decides that we're going to do the big push to create a foundation for nationalization. Within that period, they create 53 state-owned enterprises. Who will try something like that? Ended up to about 300. It, it, it grew. It <laughs> got to a point people didn't even yes. know the count. Right. But my point is this. In policy circles, in research networks, in the private sector circles that I move in, there's a lot of talk about 2050. 2050, our population is set to double. We go from 1.2 to about 2.4 billion. There are some countries like Niger, with one of the highest fertility rates, their population is set to double. Even now, they can't feed themselves. We will also have what is called a demographic dividend. And by that time, we will have more productive working people than we have either elderly or young dependents. Much of the known minerals we are exploiting are also said to run out around that time. So depending on your perspective, some are very pessimistic about where Africa would be. They give projections of growth rates that we need to be growing at to stay ahead of the curve. And when I travel across Africa, I am not sure whether people understand the urgency of the situation. So there's a sense in which in revisiting African socialism, I'm not just going back to an important part of our past, that is worth documenting. I'm also signaling to the bold visions that they had about how to quickly transform their societies in time and in space. Because if we continue doing what we are doing now, we are not going to grow at those double digit growth rates that we are supposed to grow at if we are supposed to turn out fine. We are supposed to move from extractive economies to knowledge economies. To do that, we need to build good infrastructure and things like that. Uh, there is a sense in which the West will say, eh, China is getting all your things. There's another kind of colonialism. Be careful, be this. My brother, all we have are natural resources. It's either primary exports in minerals or in crops or whatever. If we are going to transform our economies, that is our starting line. And somehow we need to make use of it to build the kinds of infrastructure that becomes the platform to move to knowledge economies. We need to be wise. We need to be wise very quickly. Uh, Prof Professor Chumfong, what you've just said reminds me of the inaugural speech of the current president, Dana Kuvada, and some of the programs which more or less are becoming slogans and how they are going to play over long run. He says there are two things. Ghana beyond aid. It's impregnated with a lot of uh, issues. Then, second, secondly, he said he's a president in a haste. And that is the concluding part of the just statement that we just made. He's in a haste. So, being in haste, as a leader, you must have a fellowship that would also identify itself 
with the, the sense of sense urgency. Of urgency. The sense of urgency. Now, if there is a dis a dislink, then there's going to be a problem. So today, for instance, we have, even though businesses are being given the opportunity, taxes are being reduced to create an envir enabling environment for them to do business. At the same time, certain areas too are also going up, depending upon the choices that we make. Today, we have some freed forwarders complaining and that the taxes are the tax for that particular area is, is high, and so it should come down. Now, we are not considering the SHS, you know, free senior secondary school education. We are not considering the capitation grants for no. kids. Now we're also going to have free technical and vocational studies. All this must be funded. So maybe we have over, um, I don't want to say simplified, but exaggerated what we can do based upon our resources. But we also told that if you're able to block the loopholes, we, are, we could be able to mobilize enough resources. Prof, we are in a dilemma. Like Amate Ebi said, the dilemma of a ghost. We are found at a crossroad once again. Political patronage. And the people say, we voted for you. We voted for you for A, B, C, D, X. Now you are becoming our enemy. Almost all governments have gone through this. Which way should we the, you You raise uh, an important question. And it is about how we create different kinds of political traditions. And, and it is important that, I often say that government is the smallest and the most visible part of society. As a government goes, so does society. And so the, the values of a government, the examples they set, it shapes things. Uh, I look, it's not just Ghana, I look at the US, at how partisan politics has become. You start an argument, where the Republicans are standing, they will be standing there, they won't move. You see White House staff trying to make sense of things that no one can make sense of. You sit there and the, the, our understanding of politics and of public office, which is about servant leadership, has changed. Uh, there is a sense in which we've looked at Zuma and state capture. Arthur Lewis commented on how still a robust middle class had not emerged. There is still a sense in which, across many African countries, the most important economic resource remains the state. And somehow, our understanding and our relationship to the state needs to be reconfigured. Because at the moment, how we understand that India. Uh, so patronage, popular patronage, a sense of, 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 of loyalty to the state, a love of the state. I think we should start doing civic classes for all Ghanaians to inculcate these values again about how the state is us. Is not something out there that one can export. Um, I know today you are going to present your next paper, but frankly speaking, uh, a lot of vistas of areas <laughs> that you've opened if I'm to keep you here. And I wish I had about two hours, three hours with you. <laughs> uh, so 
before you leave, can you leave us with the key areas of your lecture yesterday that we can carry along? And then an introduction of what is going to happen today. All in like two minutes, I yes. can see. Okay. <laughs> the yesterday, I was looking at Nkrumah Koko, the United States, and our vision to be an industrialized nation state. There is a sense in which Nkrumah, because of his concerns about new colonialism, was wary about drawing too close to the former colonial power. He had studied in the United States. The United States was the most or the richest country. Uh, so he saw the U.S. as a source of potential funding, especially for something like the Volta River project. Nkrumah wanted a modern nation state. And some of the decisions he had to make Agriculture versus industry. Mechanized farming or smallholder farming. All these issues are still with us. We're still struggling with them. And so there was a sense in which I was flagging these, that these issues have not left. And maybe the perspective from history could better inform decisions we make now because we need to make the right decisions. For today's lecture, I've already teed it off for you yeah. <laughs> about big, bold visions, about how to transform both in Krumah and in Yerere. They wanted to bring everyone along with them. They didn't want to leave anyone behind. That kind of bold vision where change does not leave anyone behind. To even think about it today, it's frightening. You, you have already pointed out that statements have been made. The, 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 the senior uh, security, the this, the that. But, but it's this sense that you want change that touches everybody. Uh, I also think that we have allowed, over the last two, three decades, external powers to define for us what is feasible, what is possible, and what we cannot. The things about that first generation is that the World Bank was how many years old when Nkrumah became president? Less than a decade. The IMF, UN was born in 1945. So the kind of weight they have today, today if the IMF official says something, and you are internal and you say something, your president will take the IMF official. But we need to be able to think boldly again. And I think the state must do that. Because no country has developed without the state playing a leading role. Well, and China is a recent example. Indeed. The Asian Tigers are. We run to Washington for our whole transformation process. At the end of the day, the Asians went their way, mobilized their human resources, and they have become the Tigers. Listeners, it's been very, very interesting and enlightening talking to Professor Achampo. Uh, this is a very good example of brain gain, and that we can tap that brain if indeed we need its services. And I'm sure he's available for that. So thank you for watching. Thank you for also listening to our video. A very small struggle is in our know, station, but I promise you that the content is always good. Goodbye.